In this video, Professor Altieri, who is one of the most important experts in agroecology, is giving us a masterclass. He will present how agroecology can be a solution to one of the threats uh, of our present and uh, our future. For example, the current pandemic or climate change and food sovereignty. So thank you in advance for watching and do not forget to subscribe to our video. Hello everybody. Um, I'm Miguel Altieri. I'm a professor emeritus of agroecology at the University of California at Berkeley, but I'm, uh, I'm now retired and I uh, pensionato and I uh, live in Colombia where I have a farm with my wife. And uh, I, I thank the opportunity that has been provided to me by the group to share with you about agroecology and as a path to reconstruct agriculture after the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'd like to share my, my screen then to show you the presentation. Is, is the present, is, uh, is it, is it yes, on the okay. panel? Okay. Yes, we see everything. Thanks. Uh, and Massimo, I, I have 45 minutes, you said? Yes, 45, don't, we, don't worry, I take the time. Okay. So, you know, in the world, um, industrial agriculture uh, dominates um, the landscape. It's um, about 1.5 billion hectares of agricultural land are devoted to these industrial monocultures that uh, are becoming a major force reshaping the biosphere. And uh, way before the pandemic, people working in agroecology started warning that industrial agriculture became too narrow ecologically, highly dependent on external inputs, and extremely vulnerable to pests and, and to climate change. And now, as uh, demonstrated by COVID-19 pandemic, it is very prone to complete shutdown by this unforeseen crisis that may be coming again in the future. So one thing that uh, the COVID-19 is revealing is how close is linked uh, human, animal, and ecological health. When we do agriculture, we're, we're basically manipulating nature. We're simplifying ecosystems. And that simplification, if it's done in the wrong way, then it can promote ecological disasters and affect human health. So these monocultures that dominate the landscapes of the world um, are very susceptible, vulnerable to climate change. For example, in the Midwest of the United States, uh, there was the worst drought in 50 years in, in 2012, which affected the, the production of soybean and corn in about 30%. And this is all transgenic corn and soybean. So the latest technology of genetic engineering was used to, pro, to produce these crops and they're, yet they're very vulnerable to climate change. If you look at what happened in California, uh, in the last five, six years, we have had huge droughts and affected about 200,000 hectares with a loss of about $1.5 billion. Uh, and the recent hurricanes that have been affecting uh, the Caribbean, for example, uh, Huracan Maria recently in, in decimated the, the plantation agriculture in, in monocultures of bananas, for example, were totally destroyed because they lack resiliency. But also uh, the crop monocultures uh, cause deforestation in order to advance the agricultural frontiers and, uh, and also the way we raise animals, genetically homogeneous animals uh, confined in, in, in small spaces. We have thousands of uh, feedlots of hogs and vast poultry, far poultry farms. Uh, and, the ca and the chaotic mixing with, of, life, life, uh, of wildlife with industrial animal production creates the conditions for the spread of these new deadly pathogens. So for example, um, the advance of soybean in South America. There's about 56, 57 million hectares of soybean, mostly transgenic soybean, that, that is being produced at the expense of natural forest. So there's a huge um, 
destruction of forest in, the system, in these areas. And what happens is that um, when you destroy the habitat, the, the forest, where this wildlife, for example, bats and armadillos and different animals coexist with different viruses, but they're contained in the forest. But when you destroy the forest, then these animals spill over into in contact with cattle and in contact with human populations. And that's the way in which uh, these pathogens are passed on to humans. And this is the path in which actually COVID-19 uh, took. And despite the fact that industrial agriculture dominates uh, about 70 to 80 percent of the arable land uses about 5.2 billion pounds of pesticides, um, uses 70% of the water and 80% of the fossil fuels, produces 30% or more of the greenhouse gases, it only produces 30% of the food that we eat. So there is a myth that industrial agriculture, modern agriculture is feeding the world. It's not. It's only 30% of the food that we eat in the world is produced by industrial agriculture. So what is happening is that COVID is revealing the socio-ecological fragility of the current industrial globalized food systems, and the effects of the pandemia on the food supply chains are already, already being felt. Um, widespread food shortages, price spikes, diet changes. A lot of people don't have access to fresh food anymore, so they have to buy, um, um, you know, um, stored food, um, and uh, migrant workers' welfare, um, many of them don't have any more work or they're exposed to the COVID-19 because in their work, they don't have the right working conditions. The school children access to lunches. For example, here in Latin America, more than 10 million children depend on school lunches. It's perhaps the only lunch that they eat during the, the, the day. And um, because the, the schools are closed, they don't have access to that food anymore. Small farmers are being displaced because they don't have access to markets. There's no transportation, et cetera, et cetera. So we're already feeling the effects of the pandemic on the food supply. And therefore, what we need is a huge transition to a more socially just, ecologically resilient, and more localized food systems. So what we need to do is to move from this industrial agriculture that is highly degrading, that depends on fertilizers and pesticides and biotechnologies and petroleum to a more sustainable agriculture that is more based on ecological processes, on biological uh, interactions and so on. And the way you do that transition, what guides that transition is a science called agroecology. So agroecology, what it is, is a, is, a, is, a, is a science that is composed on the one side by the Western science, ecology and sociology and basic agronomic sciences and so on, but then also the knowledge of traditional people that have been farming the land for thousands of years. Here in Latin America, we're blessed to have agriculture that have stood the test of time in the Andes, in Mesoamerica. There are traditional systems that have been for 5,000 years, it, it, it still exist. And then from then, from this dialogue of wisdoms, then emerges the principles of agroecology, which are the ones that guide the transition that we're talking about. So what we're looking for is an agriculture that is going to be decoupled from fossil fuel dependence, agroecosystems that are going to be very diverse, not monocultures that have low environmental impact. They're resilient to climate change. They're multifunctional. Then not only they produce ecological services, but also social services, maintain culture, maintain uh, culinary traditions, and provides also economic services to the communities. And also these systems become the foundation of local food systems where the distance between producers and consumers are shortened. So agroecology is a science that shows a different way forward providing uh, the principles on how to design and manage these agricultural systems that are going to be able to withstand the future crisis. Whether pests, outbreaks, pandemics, climate disruptions, financial meltdowns, everything that is coming with this crisis. And the reason why the systems uh, are so resilient is because they, ex they, they have a high level of diversity and resiliency, which are emergent properties recognized for their potential to reduce risk from climate change and other threats. So 
let me explain to you how I see agroecology as the basis for the, uh, the reconstruction of, um, of a new agriculture after uh, post-COVID-19, because return to the normal would be a disaster, because the normal is what caused the problem that we're facing today. So what we're talking about is that we need to come up with alternative production systems. We need to restore the matrix, the landscapes that surround the agricultural systems. We need to promote urban agriculture and rural agriculture based on diversity and agroecology. And we also need to promote a more ecologically sound management of pests and diseases without pesticides. And this would lead to healthy animals. It would contain the pathogens in their habitats. It would provide nutritional security and food security for the people. There would be increased human immunity because you eat more fresh food and vegetables and fruits and so on. And you would also have food that is uh, food uh, that is free of pesticide residues that also leads to the conservation of biodiversity, which is declining alarmingly. I don't know if you saw the last report, but there is about 60% of the biodiversity, the wildlife that is disappearing in the planet. And this obviously would lead to better livelihoods, local food sovereignty, greater, greater ecological integrity, and at the end, eco environmental and human health. So the first thing we need to do is transcend the pesticide treadmill. As I said, uh, we, we inject into the biosphere about 2.3 billion kilograms of pesticides, and many of them are immunosuppressive. Uh, some, of, uh, some of them are also endocrine disruptors that cause all kinds of health problems. But the fact that some of them are immunosuppressive is very significant for a time like that, like today, where we need to enhance our immune system. So overcoming the pesticide treadmill requires replacing the monocultures with diversified farming systems, systems where you, where you break the monocultures with polycultures, agroforestry, different kinds of designs. And this gives farmers greater autonomy because they don't have to depend on pesticides or inputs from the outside, but rather from the interactions that start happening in the systems. For example, if we break this monoculture into a polyculture, you can see here, uh, you create conditions, ecological conditions of diversity that favor what is called biological control. Biological control is exerted by these animals called predators and parasites that exist in the, in, in the ecosystems, but you, you need to supply pollen and nectar for them to thrive. So for example, in, in California, we have done experiments in lettuce plantations. These are organic lettuce systems where we um, provide some strips of flowers that attract these beneficial insects and then they control the pest without the need of pesticides. The same thing has been done in grapes uh, in California where we provide flowers of different kinds within the vineyards to promote beneficial fauna that then is going to control the insect pests that attack the grapes without the use of pesticides. The second approach is to restore the landscapes. Uh, and for this, we need to combine agroecology with ecological restoration so that we can create what we call sustainable, resilient agro landscapes. And um, <clears throat> in agroecology, what we prefer in terms of, of landscape pattern is a complex matrix of farms surrounded by forests, different forest um, remnants and corridors and things of that nature. Because in such environments, agroecosystems are rich in biodiversity that perform services for agriculture. And in addition, a, a more complex ecological matrix, a landscape surrounding the farms that is more complex, acts as an ecological fire break against uh, pathogens from ecological release. So for example, this farm here in Guatemala is surrounded by a forest. The, the forest provides all kinds of different ecological services to the farmers. For example, the farmers harvest the litter from the forest and bring it into their, into their farms, but also they act as an br ecological break because a kind of a fire break because the, the animals, the wildlife that might contain pathogens do not move into the agricultural systems. And this matrix, for example, this is in Mexico in Tlaxcala, um, this matrix that surrounds the fields provides also food for the people. Farmers do not only depend on the corn and beans and, and the crops that they produce in the fields, but they also depend on the wild fruits and other vegetables and weeds 
that uh, that are, that are grow in, in in the borders. So, for example, here you can see that the border of this field produces about 0.64 tons per hectare of uh, of food, and and inside the field, besides the crops, we have these weeds, male herbe, which um, we control with herbicides, but people eat them. They call them quelites in Mexico, and that produces 13 tons of food. Okay, so at the end of the year, you can see that um, the income after the people um, satisfy their food needs, their family, there's an extra $1,800 left from the sale of the fruits from, from the borders and from the field. And when you have these landscapes that are very complex, you also provide as a, a, a services, ecological services to the farm. For example, uh, in, in Indonesia, they found out that the fields that are surrounded, for example, here, it, these are um, rice fields that are surrounded by complex landscapes, like this case, uh, you have more predators, more beneficial insects than in the, in the rice fields that are surrounded by just uh, uh, simple systems, uh, for example, surrounded by other rice fields. And why is this important? Because when you have a landscape that, that is complex, you have more predators, which are beneficial insects, that control the pests, and therefore you have more yields and less pesticide use. So in Spanish, we call it restauración ecológica. This is an example of a degraded landscape that using different modules, uh, like windbreaks, terraces, agroforestry systems, silvopastoral systems, corridors, etc., you can restore this landscape. And there are many examples. This is uh, an example from the Mixteca in the highlands of Mexico, where this was a totally degraded environment by deforestation and overgrazing. But the, the, the small farmers wanted to stay here, but because they didn't, they, they didn't want to migrate. So they started an ecological restoration project. Uh, for example, reforesting the top of the, of the, of the mountain with, um, with an auto, uh, autochthonous pine, uh, creating terraces and water harvesting techniques because it only rains three months a year. And then uh, that allowed the community to stay there and re revitalize and reconstruct their production systems. In Colombia here nearby where we are about five hours away, there's another community that didn't have any water because the, the watershed was deforested. So they started working together, the whole community, to a point that today they have enough water for the whole community, for the animals, and for the crops. And uh, what they have done is not only a restoration of the watershed, but they have modified their monocultures. They used to work, depend on potatoes and cassava or uh, aracacha, other crops. And today that system has changed uh, to a system where they start promoting these living barriers of titonia diversifolia, which is um, composite, and then uh, end up with a system like this where you have a, a whole diversified agroecosystem, highly resilient, and that is producing fruits and coffee and vegetables and cattle, cattle manure, cattle fodder, and also um, restoring the fertility of the system. <laughs> so the results of this uh, restoration was that they recovered 75% the forest cover they became much more food secure. They produce about 90% of what they consume and resulted also in community cohesion where the uh, community became more close together uh, and, um, and working to restore the landscape and living in, in harmony with nature. The other thing is that we have found that this, when you have these complex systems, uh, they're more resilient to climate change. So we have done some studies in Central America and in, in the Caribbean, for example, when Mitch hit uh, Central America back in the, uh, in the, in, in, in the late 1990s, um, Eddie Hall Jimenez, a colleague of ours, did a research and found that the farmers that had monoculture suffered more mudslides than the farms that were uh, highly diversified, like this one, where agroforestry and contour farming and other soil conservation techniques. And in Cuba, uh, there was a, a study uh, following um, another hurricane that happened there. And you can see that the monocultures were totally decimated, whereas the uh, more diversified systems, like the one on the right, where you have um, agroforestry systems and, co and complex borders surrounding the farm that protect against the strong winds, survived uh, much better. 
So what we're finding is that the resilience of agri agri ecosystems is linked to the vegetational diversity, how much the di diversity there is uh, inside the farm, you know, in the form of agroforestry or polycultures. Uh, the landscape matrix, the more complex the, land, the landscape around the farms, the better. And also the soil management, especially increasing organic matter, soil cover, and water harvesting in areas where you have drought. The other approach is to optimize urban agriculture. It turns out that um, today more than ever, we need to promote um, localized food systems. And in many cities, there is a lot of abandoned land that could be put into production. Um, in 2005, the UNDP did a study and found out that 30% of the food consumed in the world major cities came from urban agriculture. And uh, the global urban production ranges between um, 10 to, uh, sorry, uh, 20 to 180 million tons per year. So the other, the other effect of urban agriculture is that if you have access to fresh vegetables and fruits, you, uh, you can increase your, people, uh, your immune system. So one example of urban agriculture that has been very successful is Cuba because after the, the collapse of the Soviet bloc, you know, Cuba was highly dependent on, on pesticides and fertilizers and petroleum. But then when, when the Soviet bloc uh, collapsed and didn't provide that, that aid anymore, then um, there was no way to bring the food from the, the rural areas to the urban areas because there was no gas, there was no cars. So urban agriculture started flourishing in the island to the point that 50% uh, of the vegetables that were consumed in the major cities came from uh, urban agriculture, which reached in Havana alone, 26,000 urban gardens producing about 25,000 tons of food per year, generating jobs for, children, for women and young people, especially. And today that's very important because the unemployment rate, for example, here in Colombia among the youth is 42%. So what is that youth gonna do? I mean, they need to engage in some activities. There's no jobs in the city, so they need to start working on, on, on food production. So they have um, perfected urban agriculture to a point that they can produce up to 20 kilos per square meter. And so here in Colombia, we're promoting in, um, in a nearby town um, urban agriculture uh, using local resources. Wadwa, for example, Wadwa is, is, like is like a bamboo that you see there. Um, raised beds, uh, very simple. Uh, sometimes we do tree trunks that you fill with litter from the forest and then soil on top and then you can have very productive gardens. And we are obtaining um, <clears throat> about 20 kilos per, 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 per square meter per year. That means 30 kilos of tomatoes, 30 heads, 36 heads of lettuce every 60 days, 10 cabbage heads every 90 days, and 100 onions every, every 120 days. So the, these systems can be, become very, very productive. So if uh, <clears throat> with a garden of 10 square meter, we have calculated that if each person eats 72 kilos of vegetables per year, a 10 square meter garden that is producing 200 kilos per of vegetables per year, that is 20 kilos per square meter, uh, that satisfies 55% of the annual vegetable needs of a family of five. So the potential of urban agriculture is enormous using agroecological principles. <clears throat> we also want to revitalize peasant agriculture. Uh, there's a lot of studies, even, <clears throat> excuse me, produced by uh, FAO and others that shows that agroecology can restore the production capacity of small farmers. And uh, <clears throat> the farmers in Latin America, as well as in Africa and Asia and other parts, and even in Italy where you have traditions, they have a very intimate knowledge of, the, of, their, of their agricultural systems. Um, it is estimated that about 7,000 crop species are in the hands of peasants and about 2 million varieties, genetic varieties of different crops in the hands of these uh, farmers. The Green Revolution only produced 7,000 varieties. So the farmers have 2 million varieties, which is the basis for the genetic basis for the agriculture of the future. And <clears throat> what is really revealing is that the small farmers that only control 25 to 30 percent of the land, um, use 30 percent of the water, uh, use only 20, 
20% of the fossil fuels, they produce 50 to 70% of the food that we eat. So every time you eat, you, you need to thank a small farmer. Don't thank Monsanto or Cargill because those big agricultural systems do not produce the food that we eat. <clears throat> and so we have done some experiments in, in different parts of the world. Here in Chile, for example, we designed a half hectare, half hectare, one acre farm uh, I, don't, I'm, I don't have time to go into the details of, um, of the production, but basically, or the design, but basically this is a rotational system where a family of five people live, two, two adults and three children. And uh, after three years, we were able to show that the production of this system was very high, as you can see here. For example, they produce uh, 1.12 tons of food, that's 1,000 kilos of food, vegetables in the garden, which a family of five cannot eat totally. Uh, 2,500 eggs, which a family of five will not eat in one year. And so there was, an, there was a surplus. After the family <clears throat> consumed all the food that they, they needed for themselves, except salt and pasta and rice, uh, the rest was all produced in the farm, they had an extra that they could sell. There, there was a surplus. So the farmers saved about Three hundred dollars in buying food, so that's that's an that's a, that that a, a gain. They didn't have to use pesticides or fertilizers, so that the cost of production were low, and they also had extra time after um, because they didn't they need need to weed anymore or apply fertilizers or anything like that. So they had extra time to sell their labor if they wanted to. This is in Cuba, another example of a family. Uh, the Casimiro family, which they obtained land from the government. They used to be conventional. They used to grow tobacco and corn. But after training in agroecology, they transformed their farm into this incredible system where you have a combination of vegetable crops and agroforestry systems and pa pastures with animals and so on, and with an incredible network of fence rows and and, um, and living fences that provide ecological services because they produce fruit or they produce uh, wood or they produce fodder, but at the same time, they defend them against the wind from hurricanes. And in this farm, um, they, did, they have done some very interesting studies. Um, the daughter of Casimiro, the, the owner of the farm, did a PhD with us in Colombia on agroecology. And you can find that the, 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 orange, the, orange, uh, the orange line shows the dependence, dependence on external inputs that went to almost zero from 1995 to 2015. And this farm can produce enough protein to feed 30 people from the protein producing one hectare with an energy efficiency of 30. That means they produce, they put one kilocalorie into the management of the farm and they obtain 30 back. That's highly, highly efficient. Industrial agriculture has an efficiency of 1.5. So this farm is 30 times, is 20 times more efficient than industrial agriculture. And the um, uh, lady, the daughter, did uh, research on the ecological resiliency and by using a, a different indicators, social, cultural, economic, ecological indicators. And you can see that from 1995 to 2015, the farm became increasingly, increasingly, increasingly more resilient in terms of socio-ecological resiliency. And then the last approach is to create alternative animal production systems. And these systems um, are called silvopastoral systems that you combine the, the production of water, grasses, leguminous plants, shrubs, and trees. You have like a, like a building with different layers of, of, of plants that are going to be providing different services for the animals. And in this system, because the animals uh, are in this very complex environments, ecologically rich systems, their anti uh, the antibiotics are never used uh, and their immune system of these animals is very high. So these are the, you can see the transformation from a bare grassland to this system that is very green with shrubs and trees and you can increase the, the milk production, you can increase the water, the, the, the animal carrying capacity. And in these systems, what you have uh, is a better animal condition, which uh, is called a better animal welfare, because you have 
higher humidity, you have shade, you have less temperatures, like extreme temperatures, and the systems are able to survive droughts that are common in the, in, in the area. So you can see here, the production of milk remains constant despite the variability in the rainfall in the, in the, in the system. So that's true resiliency of the, of the system. So just to start closing here, uh, how do these innovations spread? Because are all the innovations that came out from farmers, this is not university research or institutes of research that came with, with this innovation for the farmers. These were all created by the farmers themselves. Um, they, they spread to what we call in Latin America, campesino a campesino, contadini to contadini, uh, peasant to peasant, uh, which is basically a grassroots movement and it's kind of a pedagogical tool of an horizontal exchange of information, very much based on Paulo Freire's um, pedagogy. So you can see here in, 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 in Cuba, right after the, um, the collapse, there were only 216 farmers doing agroecology. Well, in less than 10 years, they had more than 130,000 farmers through the Campesino Campesino, which works by bringing a, what we call a promotor or a promotora, which is a member of a community that knows about agroecology, trains other farmers, and each one of these farmers then becomes a promotor. So later, this farmer trains 10, and then each one of these other farmers are gonna train another 10 or 15 people, and that's how the rapid spread of, the, uh, of, the, of agroecology happens through the campesino campesino system. So, <clears throat> if we want to transition our food systems, uh, we cannot just depend on the technological changes in agriculture. There has to be social movements that are gonna promote deeper changes in the economy. So it requires a major shift from cities, from societies embedded in the market economy to a greater reliance on alternative food networks. We need to create new networks of, uh, of food production and consumption. And for that, we need to use the distance between producers and consumers while ensuring that the food is accessible and healthy to everybody. Because today, for example, organic agriculture which is very common um, in Latin America, at least most of it is for the elite, the people that can eat, that can pay for the high prices of this food. We need to democratize the food system that the vulnerable, the poor people have access to food also. So for that, <clears throat> since we have these food empires, these corporations that are controlling the food system, they determine what farmers are gonna grow, what technologies they're gonna use, etc. But they also control the supermarkets, so they determine what people are gonna eat, the quality of the food, how much you're gonna pay for your food. I'm talking about the Carrefour's, the Walmart's, all this. So what we need to do, changing that structure is very difficult. So what we need to do is create a bypass where we create autonomous territories with markets that are going to be based more on, on the economics of solidarity rather than economics of uh, the market economy. So this is what we call in Latin America, economia de la solidaridad where there is exchange of money, but is, is ruled by solidarity principles between the producers and the consumers. So COVID-19 has exposed the tragedy of animal farming, of the monocultures that lead to a dramatic loss of biodiversity, that leads to obesity, malnutrition, food waste, bad conditions for the workers, the undermining of the livelihoods of small farmers, which are the ones that are producing the food. Given this reality, uh, agroecology is positioning itself today a, as a key agricultural path for the future, that we can, we can feed uh, the people with more equitable and more ecologically sound systems of production. I think an important lesson from COVID-19 is that we need to put fruit production in the hands of the small producers, small farmers and urban farmers. This is the only way to ensure that the supply of fresh food at affordable prices and in local markets are there instead of in the, in the, under the control of the, the capitalist market. This retooling of the food system based on a short supply chains will require some changes that are profound. 
Um, we need to provide small farmers with land, with seeds, with water, with equitable markets, with agroecological training and research and extension and so on and so on. That's the role of the universities, for example. Uh, it also requires, because we cannot put the weight of the change of the system on the, on the farmers only, the consumers, all of us that eat three times a day, we need to understand that eating is an ecological and a political act. Every time I go to the supermarkets, I'm supporting the capitalist food chain. But when I consume and I support the local farmers instead of the corporate food chain, I am creating socio-ecological sustainability and resilience in my community. So that's very important. We have a huge responsibility um, to when, when we, what we support with our, with our wallets in terms of consumption. So the proposal that we have is that there, there will be required profound changes, not only to break the industrial monoculture with agroecological practices, but also we need to dismantle the control of the multinationals of the food system and the neoliberal policies that maintain such structure. You see, this is not a matter of painting in green capitalism, you know, and just make it a little bit more sustainable. It requires a total transformation. So the transformational change in agriculture must be accompanied by a shift from market economy to solidarity economy, from fossil fuel dependence to renewable energy, from big corporations controlling the food system to cooperatives between producers and consumers and so on and so on. And such new world should be led by allied social urban and rural movements. We need to make alliances between the, between the urban and rural movements and becoming aware that, that the return to the agriculture it was before the pandemic is not an option. You see, this is an ecological and economic rupture, political rupture. This is what COVID-19 is, it's a huge rupture. So what we need to do, especially you young people, we need to turn farms into a vital asset for providing food and promoting autonomy while consolidating healthy agroecological territories. So instead of, in term, for example, in terms of resiliency to climate change, we need, instead of coping or adapting, we need to transform. You see, some people say climate change or system change. It's a system change because climate change is just basically the result of a system that is, that is not conducive to ecological harmony. So we need to, the, we need to decrease the, the vulnerability of our, our systems and we need to increase the response capacity. How do we respond as a society through social networks, collective action, and so on and so on to, to these emergencies that are happening? And all that has to be embraced under a solidarity type of um, umbrella. So the final question that I leave here, just to end Professor Massimo, is that um, the COVID crisis, will it provide the impetus in industrial agriculture for a transition towards agroecologically based food systems? Is it, is, it, is it providing that, is it happening? And the second, now that the global supply chains are in disarray, is it the opportunity to strengthen local and regional food hubs to prepare prepare society for looming emergencies um, such as climate change and more pandemics that probably will come again if we don't change the course of our economic model. So with that, I would like to thank you and uh, maybe open the floor for discussion and, and, and um, an exchange. Thank you very much. Grazie.